Dr. Alan Becky, for inviting me to come and share a word with uh, you at the Victor Asia Summit. And yes, I am in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I got sick with COVID and I was supposed to fly back to uh, Lethbridge. And uh, because of that, I need to spend X amount of days in, in Dallas before I can fly back. In fact, I'm flying back in a couple of days. I've seen over the years how Dr. Alan Terry um, are just incredible apostolic leaders who care for you as leaders that are there. And even today, I heard story after story of the impact that Al, Pastor Alan Terry are having and others have had on you and how that you are thriving in the ministry in the various countries. And I'm excited about that. And, um, and so today, what I wanna do, I wanted to share about long-term ministry. And I believe that's what God put in my heart. How do you stay in a ministry for long term? A number of years ago, an apostolic leader shared with me a story of a young pastor. We'll call him Pastor John for the sake of his identity, keep it private, uh, whom, he, whom he had met in a village in Bangladesh. Pastor John was told by God to plant a church, like many of you have been planting churches in that, in that village in Bangladesh. Because of the visible building, he became well-known in that area, and people were getting saved one after the other. But, of course, there were some enemies in that particular village that didn't like what he was doing. And so one night, as he was walking home from his church, uh, he was attacked by a group of radical uh, young men. He was shot in the jaw, stabbed, beaten badly, and left for dead on the side of the road. And just shortly thereafter, a young man from a YOM um, ministry found, uh, found Pastor John as he just happened to uh, walk by that same spot. He took Pastor John to his place and the YWAM team nursed him back to health as best as they could. But they knew that he needed surgery because of the bullet that in his jaw had messed up his jaw and he needed reconstructive surgery. And through the YWAM connections, arrangements were made for Pastor John to have reconstructive surgery in another country. My apostolic friend had heard about Pastor John's story and met up with Pastor John 11 years later after the incident. He had heard that Pastor John had come back to the village in Bangladesh, that same village, after the reconstructive surgery, even, even though he could have stayed away. He was told that Pastor John was still in pain most days due to the toll that the beating had taken on his physical body. But he'd also heard that Pastor John was known as the man of God that was brought back to life by God and nobody could kill him. A certain respect and fear had come on the village of Pastor John, even though the radicals weren't happy with him. So my apostolic friend, when he met with Pastor John, asked him, so how come you came back to the village? Would it not have been easier to stay away, to not worry about the radicals and persecution you face today, each day? Pastor John replied this, he said this, the reason I went back to the village is because God has never told me to leave yet. For some of you, this is probably a living reality. For others of us, it's not, at least not yet, the heavy persecution that potentially is facing you daily. But I love what Pastor El said in a video earlier, we are fearless as we face the future. And as leaders, we will face difficult and very hard situations time and time again. In light of, in, in, and so in light of that, we want to talk about how do you stay in ministry for the long haul? And then secondly, we want to finish up with how are you doing? Firstly, how, how do you stay in ministry for the, the long haul? My wife and I have been in full-time ministry now for over 30 years, and you add a few more years of volunteer. We, we were close to 40 years. And I know that Dr. Alan Terry have been ministry for well over 40 years. And I think, I think in fact, in, uh, in March of this coming year, it'll be 40 years that they started the Al Shedda House. About six months ago, a, a couple joined our church who'd been in ministry for 50 years. And um, he was more excited as I sat down with him and, and we discussed and we chatted. And, and uh, he was more excited about Jesus today, it seemed like, than he was even 20 years ago. He had not lost steam. I was reading a bit about a man called Tommy Burdett. You may have heard of him. He's from Phoenix, Arizona, United States. He is a co-pastor in uh, Dream City Church, a church of about 40,000 people. 
and he's pastoring with his son, his oldest son. And today he's 81 years old and he's still in ministry. And, uh, and he'd been in ministry for 65 years. And so I look at these ministries and I look, what, what makes someone stay in ministry that long? Um, and I believe it's just maybe a little bit like, like Pastor John in Bangladesh. They just, uh, they just, they were just determined. God hadn't told them to quit yet. So they kept moving forward. And I hear that story even from the video clips that I've heard. We also know that not everybody makes it for the long haul in ministry. There are casualties along the way, and that's sad. For it's not always an easy road to choose. No matter where we live, many of you know that. That is why when God called Isaiah, we read it in Isaiah chapter 6, the Lord asked him, who will go for me? Who shall I send? And Isaiah said, Lord, send me. And I know that's what I did. That's a scripture that the Lord spoke to me when I went to full-time ministry. Lord, send me. I cried out time and time again, Lord, send me. And then the Lord told Isaiah, he said, it is not going to be an easy road. Huh, interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? In, in fact, it is believed that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37, it talks about even uh, men of faith being sawn in two, being cut in two with a saw, that it is believed uh, through Jewish, Jewish history that it's believed that Isaiah was cut in two because he would not stop preaching. They had to stop him. They cut him. They persecuted him. That's how they got stopped. Just look at what God told King Saul, or as we know him as Paul, when God called him into ministry in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16, when just when he was blind and Ananias was told to go to him. And, and the Lord said to Ananias, tell him this, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Wow. God is telling Paul, I'm calling you into the ministry, but the road is going to be difficult, just so you know. I know for some of it, ministry is, is sometimes is viewed as being glorious, but in these cases, in these two situations over here, I find God telling me it's not going to be that easy. Make sure that you count the cost before you step in because there's going to be some hardships. Paul actually ends up talking about the difficulties and hardships he faced in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 29. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, he calls them the marks of Jesus or the stripes of Jesus. And I believe that everyone who's in ministry are going to have some marks of ministry, some stripes in ministry that are the hardships that we face that we need to pull through, that, uh, that, that, that are thrown our way to stop us in our tracks but that's not God's heart. God's heart is to say, son, daughter, you can keep moving forward. Listen to this, what Paul went through five different times. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 through 29, out of the New Living Translation I'm reading. He says, five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Wow. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced dangers in the cities, in the desert, and on the seas. I have faced dangers from men who claim to be believers, but they're not. I have worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Wow, talk about hardships and plenty of opportunity for Paul to say, that's enough. Maybe it's time to step back or even quit, but the Lord didn't tell him to quit or resign, but he just kept going. He was a man of determination. I am not going to quit. We also know that uh, but Paul talked to the Lord about the hardships, and th this is what the Lord told him a chapter later in the same book, in the Second Corinthians chapter 12, a chapter further, in verse 9 and 10. But he said to me, this is what Paul said, I talked to the Lord about my hardships, <laughs> but this is what he said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And verse 10, Paul says this, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, 
in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul had learned, even as he talked to the Lord about it, that in the midst of all it is, that God is still with him. We all know that ministry is just plain hard work. And I heard about it through a number of the conversations that I taught, heard that, that we were listening to today. That is just plain hard work. And it is with you all the time. You can't just turn it off. For it is not, it's not just a job. It's a lifestyle. That's, that's what's kept me going. It's a lifestyle. All I thought, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. It's not for the faint of heart. I love what Pastor Al said. It's not for the wimps. Um, and it's not, so it's not for the faint of heart. But it's for the courageous. It's for the fearless. For those who will see things through and get back up when they're being pushed down. We also know that uh, these last couple of years have been hard and it continues to be hard in the midst of the pandemic, not knowing what the government is going to tell us to do again and again, affecting the way how we minister, coming up with new methods to minister, trusting God that he will help us in the midst of, uh, of this, putting our trust in God, maybe in a renewed way and at, at a new level. And I love what one of the uh, pastors, I think from um, Sri Lanka said, how that his church just rose to prayer and rose up to, to pray. And this is, what, this is what should happen in those difficult times. Maybe going to God at a whole new level. Say, God, we need you. We need your help. Um, and so we see it in Proverbs chapter 3, that we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart, not to lean on our own understanding. But when we acknowledge him all our ways, even in the difficulties, that he will direct our path. In fact, in Proverbs 3, 16, 3, it tells us that when we give our thoughts to the Lord, when we roll over our cares and concerns to the Lord, he will establish our thoughts. He will put thoughts into our hearts and our minds that are beyond us, that are from heaven above itself, that we haven't even thought of, things that we haven't even thought of that we're able to pull through. I hear that in the story that Becky shared and, and about how she wrote fearless, that in the midst of this, God, how do I do this? How do I support, how do we support ourselves? And God came in with creative ideas as they sought the Lord. How do I stay in the ministry for the long haul? How do we continue to get up in morning after morning? How do we how do we have hope for the future? How do we continue to have a fresh word in our heart for the people of God that he has blessed us with? How do we keep going and going and going and going? <laughs> so I want to take these last few moments to talk briefly about something that is so important to ministry. That without this one thing, I believe, that Paul talks about, that Jesus talks about, that the prophets talk about, that I heard in Pastor John's story, and I already heard in some of the testimonies that you shared, that without this one thing, I'm sure that none of us are going to make it. Let me start with another illustration from Tommy Barnett. Remember the fellow that had been in ministry for 65 years? Was, and, um, I met Pastor Tommy Barnett in the early 1990s at his leadership conferences in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, we, we've been, my wife and I, we've been to, we went to a number of them. And in one of those conferences, he talked about the honor to quit. And he was talking to leaders. He said, the honor to quit. And I'm thinking, the honor to quit? <laughs> well, he never quit. But let me just share just a little, little thing about what he shared with us, what he does. He says, after some Sunday services weekends, and they were huge. They were, they were reaching out to people. They were getting people saved, seeing, sawing miracles. He would want to quit the ministry. He would take time to explain to God on Monday morning after the services on the weekend, the reasons why he'd want to quit and why he was done with ministry. I'm just done. But then God would speak into his life and encourage him and tell him that he could that he that he could do that um, and that he couldn't do the, that he could do the ministry. And because so many lives were changed because of him, because of the effort and the work that he put in. And after those chats that he had with God, took him a little bit. Tommy would come away from his time with the Lord all invigorated and ready to do the work of the ministry once again, even though he thought of quitting, but he never did quit because of those conversations that he had with his Lord and Savior. Sounds a little bit like Elijah at the mountain of, mountain of God in Horeb, and, and you can read about it in 1 Kings chapter 19. I think we hear, we hear the story that he had this great big victory, 
And then Dezebel said, if I don't get your head by, by the end of the day, uh, <laughs> whatever, I'm not sure what she was going to do. But anyway, so Elijah ran from, a, from Jezebel and he ended up in the mountain of God and in a cave and God spoke to him, re reinvigor reinvigorated him and went back and finished his ministry that way. Tommy's time with the Lord replenished his heart for the call on his life, as was Elijah's. Tommy knew where to go, not just weekly, but I believe daily from the testimonies I've heard from him to the presence of God, to fill himself up with God's truth and presence. Tommy knew where that well of refreshing was in a time with the Lord. Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 12, it talks about that we need to go, there is a well of refreshing, a well of salvation. It talks about in, in Jeremiah, in the Psalms, it talks about that we are to be like trees that are planted by the rivers of water, drawing from strength from those rivers of water, talking about the refreshing of, of God, the refreshing of the Holy Spirit coming into our hearts and lives, ministering to us. Let me just turn to Acts chapter 20. And we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it's going to read one verse, but let me just set it up for you. Paul was on his way to Jerusalem from his third missionary journey. And uh, he just stopped south of Ephesus in a place called Miletus. He didn't stop in Ephesus, but just a couple miles south of that. And he sent for the elders of the, and are the leaders of the Ephesians church. Just like Pastor Alan Becky have gathered you together today. He sent, he, so Paul did the same thing. He gathered them together and said, hey, I just want to talk to you because I'm not sure if I'm going to meet with you again. Because Paul knew that he was bound in the spirit, the Bible says, to go to Jerusalem and he was going to be caught. He didn't know whether it was going to be the end of his life or not. He didn't probably know he was going to write the book of Ephesians later on. But he, he said this. He, he has a whole bunch of things that he shared. But in the midst of it, verse 28, Paul shares this, this very important key. He says, therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Did you see what Paul said? That in the face of everything they might be facing, because Paul said, after I'm gone, ravenous wolves are going to come, and they're going to come in to try and destroy the church. Now, he doesn't talk about growth strategy. He doesn't talk about programs. He doesn't talk about Bible studies. He doesn't talk about preaching styles. He doesn't talk about leadership roles. Even though those things are very, very, very important and we see that even in the book of Acts chapter 2, throughout the book of Acts, throughout the word of God, these are so important. But Paul doesn't talk about that. What does he talk about? He tells them there's one very important thing for the longevity of their ministry, for the, for the growth of the church. First of all, he says, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. I cannot emphasize that enough tonight as I'm sharing with you. Take care of yourself. So that what? That's what Paul is saying. Take care of yourself so that you can take heed to all the flock which the Holy Spirit has put you in charge of to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church, the ministry is so important to Jesus. That's why God's called you and I into the ministry. But we're not going to take, we're not going to go very long if we don't take heed to ourselves, if we don't look after ourselves, if we don't fill ourselves up. Paul is saying this, guys, make sure that you take heed to yourself. Your first priority in ministry is that you take heed to yourself. Therefore, you should be self-disciplined in your own spiritual growth. Um, you should have a daily time with the Lord. You should have a place that you come to on a daily basis to, to the well of refreshing, as I shared before, to be refreshed and to be filled with the Lord, like Tommy Barnett did on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. And I'm sure as I look at the leaders that have been ministry that I shared about, I look at Pastor Ellen Carey, I look at this, this pastor that are in my church now had been a minister for 50 years. I'm sure that that's the key that they are following, that daily time with the Lord, to spend time with heaven, to spend time with, with our Lord and Savior, with our God, so he's able to fill us back up, to replenish us as we give out so much of ourselves and then when we do the work of the ministry because it's not always easy it's hard work it's not for the whim it's for the for the courageous and for the fearless but we do need to go to the well of refreshing if you don't maybe not today 
Maybe not tomorrow, but you will run out of spiritual strength. And then you will be doing ministry on your own human strength. And that is not good. Not good at all. I've seen that. I've seen it in my own life. I'll give my own testimony at the end here today. Uh, you won't have spiritual vitality. You won't have freshness about you. You won't, you, 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 um, you won't have a fresh word from heaven. You'll lose touch with what God is doing and saying at the moment and even for the future. You'll, use dire you'll lose direction and purpose. You'll be walking in yesterday's vision, which is, dry, which is drying up. And even though it's good for a period of time, there needs to be a renewed, fresh, fresh vision on a daily basis. Proverbs 29, verse 18 talks about that we need to, that the vision is continual. It keeps going and keep, it keeps going. There's an unfolding of the vision of God for your life. It's not yesterday's vision, but it keeps unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. But you're not going to get that until, unless you spend time with the Lord, because he desires to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, in your communities, in your countries, in your families, in your churches. But you're not going to know what it is if you do not spend time with God. You'll be running on the empty, barely making it. There will be, you'll be in a downward spiral, which is not good. Wow. Have you ever thought about that? I was reading an article the other day by Rick Warren, and probably most of you know that Rick Warren, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life and uh, pastor of Saddleback Church, a network of about 40,000 people again. In a recent article just um, about a week ago, in response to COVID and what's happening in the church and, and the leaders, he said this. In his article, he, inf he inferred that many leaders today are running on empty. So there's not much to give. Now, I'm not sure if that's you or not. He was just generalizing maybe from the circle that he was in. But he says, so many leaders are running on empty. And then when crises like hardship, like COVID and, and hardships come, they will have a hard time leading or they will just fall apart or fade away in ministry. And he said, that's not my heart. And I know that's not Pastor Allen and Becky's heart for you. That's not my heart for you today. That's not my heart for the leaders in my church today. I want them to prosper. I want them to move forward. I want them to, to reach the goals that God has for them. I want them to reach the high call of God in Christ Jesus daily, weekly, and monthly, even for the future, so that you're in it for the long haul. What was Paul's heart behind what he said? We are called. We are called to take care of Christ's minister here on earth. His ecclesia. For whom he died, as verse 28 says. We are to be busy in ministry with people in preaching and programs and projects and however the Lord leads in building his kingdom. But the key to this, we are not to neglect taking care of, our, of ourselves. Let me say that again. We are not to neglect taking care of ourselves. We are not to be busy, so busy that we do not take care of ourselves, that we forget about our spiritual life. We forget or we ignore Or we just think that we are super Christians. We are super leaders. And I don't need to have that daily personal relationship with Jesus and his words. This is so easy to do in ministry. Because when you're busy and make the excuse that I'm working hard for the Lord, God knows. He'll, he'll, he can fill me on the run. Yes, he can. But that's not what God wants to do. It is no, 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 no. Don't think. Don't go there. Don't go there. There will be times, and there is grace for the moment at the moment. But, do, but remember, go back to the well of refreshing. Go back to, to, to the stronghold of your hope, as Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12, I believe it says. Go back to that stronghold, that place where you receive from the Lord, and there's a strength that is imparted in your life that, you, that is enough for the day ahead of you. You see, you only do this for so long. Before you run, before you keel over and run an empty or run em, run an empty, begin to keel over if you don't do this. Paul understood this. God knows this. In fact, Jesus talks about this to, to his disciples. In the night before he was betrayed in the upper room, there was a number of chapters in the in the book of John. And, and so John 15, a simple verse. You might have preached on this verse here. John 15, verse 4 through 6 and, and verse 8. Jesus said this: abide in me. The night before he was betrayed, he's telling the disciples this one important key thing, just like Paul is telling the Ephesian elders in chapter 9, verse, uh, chapter, uh, in chapter 20, verse 28. He says, abide in me. He says, live in me, remain in me, dwell in me. That's the, what the word abide in me means. 
and I in you. In other words, the way I'm going to live in you, the way I'm going to be fresh in you, the way I'm going to be strong in you for the future so that you have enough strength in you. That it means that I need to abide in the Lord. This is so good. He continues to, he continues to say, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. In other words, we are grafted into the, into the tree. We are a branch. If the branch is pulled out of the tree, it's going to die. It's going to shrivel up. But it needs to be abiding in a tree. And that flow of the presence of God needs to flow from the tree, from the stem, from the root, right into that, right into that branch so that you're able to bear fruit. He continues to say, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I, Jesus, am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Jesus promises that. If you abide in me, if you'll spend that time with me, if you'll come back to the well of refreshing, if you'll come back to the place to drink with me, to that closet time, that time away with the Lord, just you and I, the Lord says, you're going to bear fruit. It's a promise from the Lord. For without me, you can do nothing. Let me read that again. Jesus said, for without me, you can do nothing. We can do things in human strength, but it's not going to last. It's not going to last. You're going to run dry. But he said, Jesus, with me, you can do all things. And it's going to have power. It's going to have anointing. It's going to have a freshness to it. And people are going to grab onto it. They're going to give hold of it because the anointing and the presence of God that is connected to it. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them in the fire, and they are burned. They are removed, and they're gone. We don't want to go there. That's not our heart for you. That's not God's heart for me, for any of us that are watching here, for any of the leaders that are, you are there today. That's not God's heart for you. Why? Because verse 8, it says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Wow. This is God's heart for us, that we bear much fruit. And I'm seeing the fruit that is happening. I'm hearing about the fruit. So excited about these testimonies. But how do you keep bearing more and more and more fruit? In order to do that, we have to abide in him. That over the years, some of you are starting out in ministry. Some of you have been in long time as many. Some of you have been in real long time in ministry. But God wants you to bear fruit every day of the year, every day of your ministry cycle. Not to slow down, but to, but to move forward and to bear more and more and more fruit so that you bear much fruit. Can you see how important it is that we take heed to ourselves? You see, we can have all the right programs, all the right tools, all the even the right dreams and visions, leadership abilities, the greatest leadership abilities, and even have the right people around us. But if I'm not spending personal time with the Lord, I'll lack the life of God, I'll lack his presence, I'll lack his anointing. And as you dry up, so the ministry will be affected by it. And at least that's what Jesus said in verse 6. The branch will wither away and be thrown away. If I don't take care of me, I will eventually run out of steam and dry up. So how do we stay in the long run and stay in ministry for the long haul, for the long journey? By making sure that you take heed to yourself. Let me just give you six practical things that you can do. Uh, there's one or two of them in there, but let me just give six things that, uh, that you need to do in order to, for you to be able to, to stay strong in the Lord, to, to be filled up. Number one, no one is able to do this for you. You have to do this yourself. Let me say that again. No one is able to do this for you. You have to do this yourself. You can't phone up Pastor, Pastor Al or, or Zoom and say, Pastor Al, I'm not doing well. I need some filling in. Can you, can you spend some time with God for me? Or your, your church can't do it for you. Or your leadership can't do it for you. You have to do it yourself. You have to take time, daily time, to be with the Lord. You have to set that time aside. I know if you went to VBCI in, in Sircha, that I know that you taught this. You get up early, 5 o'clock in the morning. You exercise. You pray. You spend time with God. But sometimes in ministry, that can fall away. We think, well, I've done all that. we got to say, no, 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 no. you got to keep doing it. you got to spend that time with me. This is the key to surviving and the, the key to long-haul ministry. Strong leaders, secondly, so no, firstly, no one is able to do this for you. You have to do this yourself. Secondly, strong leaders need to lead themselves first before they can be lead others. At least that's what I heard Pastor Al say today. Did you not tell him in that video? I love that. And I know it for myself. I can't lead anybody unless I'm leading myself. Strong leaders 
lead the lead themselves. Thirdly, get into a disciplined habit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, he said this, I discipline my body. I keep it in check. Lest when I preach to someone, I myself am disqualified. And so Paul understood this principle of being in a discipline, having disciplines in your life that are that are that are, that'll help you in ministry. And one of them, I believe, the top the top one, priority one is is to spend that time with God. So therefore, for, fourthly, daily spend time with the Lord. I know for me, it's to get up early. That's the best time to do that. To get up early, I do spend time with the Lord just before I go to sleep. I read His Word. I pray, but. But my major time with the Lord is at the front end of the day. In fact, David said this in Psalm 63, verse 1 through 5. He says, he says, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. God, David is saying, God, I, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. So I'm going to spend some time with you. My, I will, and so because of that, I'm going to spend some early time with you. And in verse 5 says, because of it, because he does that, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and with fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with, with joyful love. Like Pastor Tommy, he walks in discouraged and he comes out encouraged. Why? Because he spent time with God. He spent, he spent time in the refreshing of God through his word and through the presence of God. God ministering to us, speaking encouraging words into him. God doesn't want you to quit. God wants to wants to see his kingdom come so he's encouraging us son daughter you can do this move forward and the next thing you know we have walked out of the scourge one morning into our bright into the presence of god but we come out with fire with boldness with courage fearlessness upon our heart so that we're able to step up and say devil watch out here i'm coming right fifthly take a weekly sabbath uh, take a take a weekly sabbath rest for yourself if that's possible i know this was hard for me because I'm by nature, I'm a hard worker. By nature, I could work seven days a week. But I've noticed that over the years, I can't do that. For the long haul, you've got to take some time sometime on a, on a weekly basis. Take some time for yourself. Go for a walk. Go do something different. Go, go do, do, do a project of some sort that is just for you, to help you. However you want to do that. You ask the Lord about that. I like doing renovation. So I'm renovating my home a little bit. The basement in my home, I'm re I've been renovating it. And so that, that just gets my mind up things. I'll have praise and worship tape uh, praying and playing in the background, or I'll do some other things. I'll go with my wife. We'll go shopping or something like that. And, uh, but just, just a, to a, a bit of difference. And so I find myself when I do that, I, even in that, I replenish. If God has to rest the day when he created the world in six days and the seventh day he rested, how much more should we not do that? We're not above God. And I know again, there's grace at times. Where, where, we, where we'll work maybe a week or two, uh, a little longer. But I know for myself, I feel it. I feel it. Now I have to go back. No, no, I need to have that one day. In fact, the Bible said, you can look at in, you look up in the Bible in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. It, it tells us what the Sabbath rest ought to do, that we ought to keep the Sabbath day holy or sacred or, or set apart for us, for that refreshing in, into our hearts. But I'm not talking about a Sunday. I'm talking about you as an individual to take some time during the week and say, hey, I just need some time by myself. And uh, whether it's with the Lord for a day, however you want to spend that, so important. And then sixthly, hold, so, hold yourself accountable to someone who can ask, how are you doing? This is so important. I'm part of a mentoring group on a weekly, on a weekly basis that they, uh, and they, I, they ask me, to, they're allowed to ask me the question. They don't ask me every week, but they're allowed to ask me, how are you doing, Wayne? Now, I can, be, I can lie to them or I can be real to them, but the best thing is to be real in those situations. Rick Warren, again, in that same article, he recommends uh, when it comes to being routine, he said this, daily routines, daily routines like this develop resilience. They develop resilience. He says predictability creates stability in ministry and life. In other words, you're predictable enough to say, no, I can't have the meeting that day. Uh, in, or that early in the morning, because I'm spending time with the Lord. It creates steadiness, stability, sorry, in ministry and life. And the structures that like the structure like that, 
it creates steadiness in your life. In other words, you are stable, you are steady, and there's resilience about you, able to bounce back. Resilient mean, meaning that you're able to bounce back from hard times because you are spending that time with the Lord. You know that even though that a day may be hard for you, you're going to spend some time with the Lord, and in the next morning uh, that you're going to spend some time with the Lord, and we're, you're going to have you and God are going to have a chat, and He's able to breathe that freshness back into you and ability to get back up again, to have that courage to continue to lead on because we're all going to have those days where we're going to have some pain, we're going to have some hard times, but we we need to be able to lead through that, right? And that comes from the presence of God, the courage and the strength. This is what I found in my life, the resilience and the stability and the steadiness. It's so easy to fall back into the old routines or thinking that is not necessary, that is not necessary for me because I'm serving Jesus and I'm busy. I'm telling you, don't, take, don't receive that lie. It is a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie. You need to spend that time with the Lord. It is the key. It is one of the top keys. Not the only key. But it's the top key, I believe, to spend that time with the Lord. So my question that I could ask you, the question I could ask you now, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are each one of you doing today? Or you could ask this question yourself. How am I doing? How am I doing? Some years ago, I had asked that question myself. In the fall of 2017, which is four and a half years ago, after being in ministry for about 28 years, I was, I was on the brink of quitting. Thought ran through my mind, not daily, but often. And I was toying with the idea of resigning because I was running on empty. You see, we were in the middle of, build, uh, in the middle of uh, building a big project, building a brand new building, the biggest project I'd ever taken on as a church that the Lord had spoken to us to build five years earlier. It was an exciting time. That's the thing. It was an exciting time. But Wayne was thinking about quitting. And no one knew. Even my wife didn't know. I didn't tell anyone. But inside, I knew that I was empty. And I said, Lord, how can I get out? What's the escape route? And in the midst of this project, we were seeing miracle after financial miracle. In fact, we wrote down 30 financial miracles. The miracles were happening left, right, and center. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I so love um, and, I, and I so love the, the testimonies of what I'm hearing of the these buildings going up, the miraculous that I'm hearing. We saw that too. Miracle after miracle, financial miracle after financial miracle. It was a great time for the church as God was supplying what we needed and much more. But Wayne was thinking about quitting. So it wasn't about the miracles. It wasn't about the building. It was about Wayne. Wayne should have been excited about it. But there was something, there was emptiness inside of him. And the emptiness was speaking to him. I would dream of what quitting would look like, what I could do. But then the Lord, the interesting thing in the midst of it, the Lord, the Holy Spirit would show up on me and I would be not be fulfilled. Uh, and, and that is not what he had called me to do, to quit. That's what the Lord told me. And hadn't called you to quit. <laughs> Just like he told Pastor John in Bangladesh, then called him to quit. So I would ask the Lord, how do I get through this season? He would tell me, spend that extra time, daily time with me. But I just felt I couldn't do it because it was too busy with the church and the building project. And I didn't have the strength, it seems like, to be able to even to do that. But God was working on me, and he opened a door for me to face what, where I was spiritually. Because God's interested in me. He's not interested in my downfall. He's interested. He's interested in me and you to meet, to thrive, and to move forward, and to fiercely and courageously move forward, no matter what you're facing. Because God is bigger than anything that you're facing. I am in him. He, he is in me, and I am in him. So that makes us a majority. Amen? Exactly four years in January 2018, about six months after I was dealing with this, I went to a conference where I confessed where I was at and repented of my lack of spending time with him. I needed the Lord to do a miracle in me, and he did. He loved on me. He filled me. He strengthened me. And as, as I sat in that conference, I said, I can do this. Four words in my heart. I can do this. I can spend that extra time with the Lord. I can get up earlier. Something shifted in my heart. As I said, I can do this. I saw it in my heart, and I said, I can do this. And you know what? I've been doing this every single day since I, not every single day, 
because there had been some days. But the Lord said, no, wing, pick it back up again. And I'm right back again. I'm care very careful now of my time with the Lord. I guard it like crazy. Since that day, I'm in a totally different place. As I lean daily into the Lord, daily spend that personal time with him. If you want to stand, if you and I want to stay in ministry for the long haul, for the long journey, you are not going to do it on your own. You will need that daily fellowship with the Lord our God, who will give you the courage, the strength, and the freshness to sustain you, to sustain you in all things. Listen to what Isaiah said. Remember, the Lord had told him that ministry was not going to be easy. Remember that? And here, uh, 40 chapters later, uh, or 34 chapters later, I mean, it's a little later in his life, he recognizes the key to being long-term in long-term ministry. Remember, they had to cut him up to shut him up. <laughs> so Isaiah 40, verse 28 to 31, again, a familiar scripture. You probably preached on it. But let's read that one more. Let's just read that. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. For 29, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Did you hear that? He increases strength. Verse 30. Now listen to verse 30. It says, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young man shall utterly fall. Do you hear that? They won't make it on their own if they don't spend that time with God. That's what Isaiah is saying. He says, look, you can be young. You can be youthful. You can have all the energy because the youth and the young, they're just so full of energy. They're ready to go. They don't need to sleep. Maybe as like we do as you get a little older, they may get by on three or four hours of sleep a night and pick back up again. But when you get a little older, it doesn't work that way, at least not for my life. But he's saying that strength is going to run out and you're going to fall and you're going to faint. At least that's what Isaiah said. That's what the word of God says for 31. But I love the buts in the Bible. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew the strength. Those who wait on the Lord. The word wait means that when you spend time with God, he weaves himself into your heart. The word of God weaves himself through you. So there's something that happens inside of your heart, in your soul, that gives that courage back again, that strength back up again. They shall mount it with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah knew that he could not make it without that regular time with his Lord. For the long haul, he also needed God's strength and ability to soar that time with the Lord. What is this one thing so important that I need to do to stay in ministry for the long haul? As Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and it's the same principle today, therefore take heed to yourself so that you're able to take heed of the church that the Holy Spirit has called you into the church that Jesus died for, God's church. If we want to take care of God's ministry in the long haul, one of the top things that we need to look after is ourselves. How are you? Really? How are you today? Have you been taking heed to yourself? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you taking time with the Lord and his ministry? Maybe some of you are, and maybe some of you aren't. I don't know who you are. Only you know, and only Holy Spirit is able to convict you. Maybe you're at a point of, of you saying, I'm excited for this conference, but you came in empty. You came in, you came in weary. You came in tired. And he said, oh, I barely made it. I barely made it to the Zoom meeting. I barely made it to this meeting over here. But you know what? Just like God ministered to me, just like God ministered to Elijah, uh, uh, Elijah in that, in that cave. So God wants to minister to you today. He wants to speak words of encouragement into your heart. I want you just to bow your head for a minute, if you could, and, and just close your eyes for a minute and just pull all distractions away. And maybe just allow Holy Spirit just to come and just to minister into your heart. And just allow the Holy Spirit to, to show you where you are. Maybe you don't even know yourself where you're at. So this is not condemning. This is not a place where you say, oh, you bad boy, you bad woman. No, no, that's not what God is doing here. God is saying, son, daughter, I want to take you to a new level. I want to take you to a new place. I, I guess 2021 and 2020, 2021, probably been some of the hardest years that we've had to work through. We had to come up with new ideas, creative ideas. But maybe there's a weariness that have come upon you. Maybe there's a tiredness that come upon you. And today I believe Holy Spirit just wants to come and bring some freshness, 
some strength into your heart, just like he did to me. Maybe take a moment and just say, Lord, I've forgotten to come into your presence. Lord, I, I've neglected some of these things. I've been so busy that, Lord, I've not taken the time. I've not taken the daily time. I've not maybe taken a Sabbath rest on a weekly basis. I've not spent time with you. Lord, I've been giving and giving and giving and giving. And God sees that. And he's encouraged and, and he's blessing you. But I believe for us to move forward into 2022, for what is ahead of us, I don't know what's ahead of us. I love that scripture, Isaiah 61, where, 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 uh, that, that was given to us today uh, by our pastor from Sri Lanka. And I praise God for that scripture, that he wants to refresh us. And so I just pray for that. Lord, I pray even right now. For, for the team that is here, the leadership team that is here, that has been, that has been, that has been here, Lord God, the, the, the people that are watching the, through live stream and on Facebook, but all these 80-some leaders, Lord God, are watching here today. Lord God, would you just stretch your hands out towards them? Maybe, maybe just lift your hands up to the Lord. And that's just a sign of, Lord, I need some strength today. I need, I, need some, I, need, I need you to come and just to fill me with your strength, with your power, with your mind. So Holy Spirit, would you just miraculously Come even right now and just fill. Just fill. Fill with your power. Fill with your strength, Lord God. Maybe make a commitment and say, I can do this. If Pastor Wade can do this, if, 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 if so-and-so can do this, if Elijah, if, if Isaiah talks about it, if, if John uh, from Bangladesh, if, if he can keep going, I can keep going. I can keep going. But Lord, I need your strength. Moses said, to him, Lord, I cannot go. I'm not going further unless your presence and your power comes with me. In 2022, we can't do this on our own. We can't come up with programs on our own. We can't keep doing this on our own. We need the Lord, and then we can do it. Then we have the strength to do it. Then we have the vision. Then we have the freshness to be able to move forward into 2022. Lord, bless our people. Bless the team. Bless the leaders today. I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, Sharaba Haraba Shandra. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, just come, just come, just come and just minister. Holy Spirit, put a fresh word in the heart. Maybe, maybe what you can do is just in a moment here, if that's you, maybe repent before they say repent before the Lord and just take some time and say, Holy Spirit. Just come. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of not spending that time with you. I repent of leaning upon my own strength. I repent upon leaning upon the people to do all the work. Lord, I'm weary. I'm tired from all the hard work. Lord, I love you. But Lord, I need more of you. I need your strength. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power is might. Actually, Paul starts out that verse in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, finally, my brethren. In other words, I've told you all of this, Ephesians. <laughs> but finally, 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 my brethren. Finally, my brethren. We're strong in the Lord and the power is might. And then he goes into the, the idea of that we're in a warfare. He says, put on the armor of God. But he says, finally, my brethren. Be strong in the Lord and the power is might. Amplified version said, through the communion and fellowship with the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. It's through the fellowship and the communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way we're going to stay strong in ministry. I know it myself. I've been there. Like I shared with you. And, and it's like, I wouldn't want to do ministry without the Lord, without his presence, without spending that time with him. Because he's the one that refreshes. He's the one that gives freshness. He's the one that gives encouragement. He's the one that, that gives renewed vision time and time again. That progressive vision that Proverbs chapter 29, 18 talks about. The progressive vision that keeps us moving forward more and more and more. So that you have the fresh ideas from heaven daily, weekly, monthly. So you're able to do the work of the ministry. And so, Lord, I thank you that you hear their repentance. Lord, you said that if we confess our sins. You are just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me just ask you this. Will you receive God's forgiveness? Will you just receive God's forgiveness even right now? Because the Bible says that if we repent of these things, then he will forgive us. Now, Lord, would you just come 
Would you just come? Uh, would you just come to each individual, Lord God, today? And would you just breathe a fresh word? What is it individually that you just want to breathe into, that you want to speak into these individuals' minds after their confession, Lord God? Lord God, now that the slate is clean, the plate is clear, it's been washed by the blood, it's been cleansed, Lord God. Father, would you just place a word, a thought, a picture, an image, something that would be near to the, to the, to the leadership today? Would you just put something in their heart that is your truth for them. That is your truth for them. Let's just wait for a few moments. Let's take a moment and just wait on the Lord. Not leaving. Let's just wait for a few moments. Let's just listen to the Lord. Because I believe there's some, I sense in my heart, that God wants to speak to some that you were discouraged. I know one person, God, you, you're discouraged. You're, you, you were, you, you are where I was at. But you know that day that God spoke to me? He said, son. I love you. I have so much more for you in 2018. In January 2018, exactly four years ago when it happened. I have so much more for you. So let's just wait for a moment. Allow the Holy Spirit just to minister into your heart. Maybe you want to write it down. If you've got a piece of paper, maybe journal it. I know I journal a lot of stuff that God in my private time, my time with the Lord, I do a lot of journaling since that day. And that's really helped me because I can go back to what the Lord has spoken to me, what he shared with me. I've never, I've never done that before, but I journal a lot of things. And that has really helped me. I write, I journal my dreams, I journal my thoughts, I journal what God puts on me in my heart. And then I pass it by my, our staff, I pass it by our people, by some of our people that I trust and say, hey, what do you think? And out of that comes the vision of God for my personal life, but also for the ministries that we're involved with. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But now, the, the usually you say, well, where, where do we hear the, the thoughts of God? Usually in a meeting like this, it's, something, it's the first thoughts that come to your heart and mind. A scripture, a thought, maybe a picture, that would mean something to you. That would mean something to you. And so, Lord, I thank you for your truth. I thank you. It's the truth that sets us free and it keeps us free and it keeps us moving. Lord, I thank you that your truth is heaven's word, heaven's word for today. Your truth, that Rima truth, that now word that you're speaking into people's hearts. That's the truth, Lord God. That's who you see us at. You see us as mighty warriors, as giant slayers, Lord God. Not as, not as puny, but as giant slayers in the midst of the giants, Lord God. You see is that, Lord, there may be some giants before us. There may be some things before us. How are we going to do all this? But, Lord, I thank you. Just like Moses or just like Joshua stepped into the nation of, uh, into, the, into the promised land. Lord, as he spent time with you, you gave him strategy after strategy after strategy. And even when he did it wrong, Lord God, you, they, when they repented, God, when, they, when things weren't going right, Lord God, Lord, you're, you, you got him back up again. And he said, no, now keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And, he, and as he spent that time with the Lord, as he spent that time in the tent of meeting, Lord, I thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, I thank you for the individuals, Lord God. Thank you for those words, that truth, that truth, that truth, that truth. Thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.